thank you for coming to this one. It is really important to get your opinions and we're looking for depth and rigour when you provide us with your ideas. So we might push and prod a little bit in order to get really the most valuable information from you. So thank you very much and I'll hand over to Daniel now. Thank you very much, Amanda. Um, thank you for joining us today in the, uh, the most interesting breakout session that we've got here as part of the uh, uh, annual planning forum. Um, I'm really keen for this session and I look forward to uh, receiving the feedback that you have and really using that to shape how we do things at Powerlink. I'll probably need my clicker to start as well so I can <laughs> progress the slides. Thank you. So as uh, Amanda said, the presentation will run for approximately 30 minutes, have a group discussion between 30 and 45 minutes and then a wrap up uh, um, for around 15 minutes in that space. So what I'm really keen to do as part of this presentation is give an overview of what non-network uh, solutions and engagement currently means for Powerlink. Uh, trying to paint a picture and give enough information such that in the discussion that we have towards the end of this session, that we can gain and glean some, some really good feedback uh, from you guys and, and how we can improve our process, what works well or what could be done better. In the presentation today, we'll touch on what we've done in the past, um, look at where we've engaged non-network solutions historically um, and look at how those non-network solutions have really um, impacted on our network and what we've done in that space. I think it's important to touch on our current operating environment, as Stuart did in the main presentation, just to really frame how non-network solutions fit into uh, Powerlink's uh, investments going forward. And we'll talk about how Powerlink is responding in that space and how that impacts uh, future non-network solutions. I'd like to spend a little bit of time then talking about the current processes that Powerlink has for non-network solutions and engaging non-network service providers and then run that through a practical example that we've got uh, currently in play at the moment. So what has Powerlink done in the past? Uh, we've had a long history of engaging non-network service providers even prior to regulatory consultation requirements. Uh, around the early 2000s we were engaging, engaging with generators in north and far north Queensland uh, in relation to providing support to loads. Um, the first main one we got involved with was in the summer of 2005-06 and it was in relation to the Green Bank to Maudsland 275 kV transmission line. What it allowed us to do was defer that investment for a period of a year um, to support the peak summer load um, by allowing directly to import into Queensland. The main example that we can give and the largest example that we've got of uh, procuring non-network support was to do with our reinforcement from central into northern Queensland and the development of double circuit 275 kV lines between 2005 through to 2010. And that involved the development of the lines from Broadsound to Nebo, from Nebo into Strathmore, and Strathmore into Ross. What this allowed us to do was to ensure that transfer capability was maintained from central into northern Queensland, allowed us to meet the peak demand in the summer period, and it also assisted with project staging. So it had multiple uh, benefits to Powerlink engaging non-network support. And as you can see from the slide down below, the type of network support that we engaged was quite varied. It was generation, there was some load-based DMs, DSM, and also some co-generation. So it was a range of, uh, provided by a range of non-network solutions in that space. What you see there on the top of the slide was the, uh, the, the, the latter stages of that project. And again, um, a range of co-gen and generation was used to supply the load. Powerlink's most recent uh, example of procuring non-network support was out in the Bowen Basin coal mine where we uh, were able to defer the development of a 132 kV line from Nebo to Morval to Broadsound and the establishment of a 132 kV substation at Broadsound uh, by a non-network support agreement burning uh, coal seam gas um, out in, in the uh, Moorumbar area. So that was uh, really beneficial to Powerlink in that we were able to defer that investment into the future and save a significant amount of capital in that space, capital investment in that space. Now I think it's important to touch on our current operating environment and Stuart touched on this more, more so in the main presentation but it's important to paint the context of where we're currently operating in to give an idea of where non-network solutions can fit into the picture. What we're seeing is consumers believe that electricity prices are too hard 
uh, sorry, not too hard, too high, and, and we need to do something about them. While we only have a small proportion of the electricity bill, around 9%, we still have a role to play in pushing, putting downward prices on electricity. We know from the presentation before that the electricity demand into the foreseeable future is uh, looking to be flat and plateau out for the next 10 years. So that really impacts on how we plan and how we reinvest into our network. We know that the economic outlook is softening. We've seen the growth in China slow, uh, which has had impacts to the mining industry within uh, Queensland and also the overall state economy. And we've also got this piece of emerging technologies. We're seeing consumers put uh, solar panels on their roofs to offset their electricity demand. And now we're seeing batteries come down at lower pr pr price points with consumers engaging in that space. So there's all these things that uh, are happening in the operating environment that PowerLink operates in. So the question is, well, what are we doing? How are we responding? We have awareness of these, and what do we do? So as Stuart mentioned at the main, main previous, and I suppose there's a lot of repeti repetitivity here, but it's mainly to frame the approach to the non-network solution. We're, we're changing the approach that we have to our, uh, our investment in our network. We're looking at different ways of doing things. We've amended our reliability standards so that we can be more flexible in how we plan our network. We're looking at ways on how we can uh, improve our network utilisation of our existing network. Non-network support has a great role to play in that space. Uh, we're consistently considering on how stakeholders are impacted by the decisions that we make. This forum in itself is uh, one of those key examples of how we're looking to improve our engagement with stakeholders. We've also previously held area plan forums to gain more information on uh, stakeholders' values in those areas that we've had. We engage regularly with a consumer challenge panel uh, on certain topics that uh, are important to PowerLink and also to stakeholders. We've developed in the non-network space what we call the Non-Network sta uh, Stakeholder and Engagement Register, which is a list of uh, interested non-network proponents which we uh, keep in contact with and communicate with for not potential non-network solutions into the future. We've also enhanced on how we manage the end of life of our transmission lines and, and the suite that we've got uh, in that space and determining how we can uh, economically improve the life of those transmission lines into the future and the suite of projects that we can apply to those lines to get most economic benefit. It all comes back to this idea, idea of optimisation and what, what that actually means is more of an integrated approach to our planning, looking at where the end of life of our assets are Understanding whether there's an enduring need for those assets. Is there an enduring need out into the future or is it within a five or two to five year period? Given that, do we invest significantly in the asset? Our main aim is to reduce the lowest long run cost to the consumer, um, but in, at the same time, provide flexibility within our investment solutions moving forward such that we don't uh, pan ourselves into a corner and uh, invest too early in, in the network. So we're really changing our approach and having that integrated approach across our planning and strategies areas to go and come up with the best solution for consumers um, in, in that space with, with the idea of driving down electricity prices. So where do future non-network solutions play? And as I touched on before, non-network solutions, and as you've seen, they have the ability to reduce the scope of um, existing investments or defer larger network investments into the future. What we're seeing is that new technologies will change how this occurs and there will be emerging technologies and as they come down in price, we'll be able to be applied to the transmission network. What we see is there'll be that economic benefit to consumers um, from this avoided or deferred network investment into the past, which obviously has uh, that price sensitivity and will push the prices down. What we're also keen to see is how non-network solutions can improve the utilisation of our net network and how flexible they can be to assist us using our existing network to provide the reliability uh, service that we need to. So now we've talked about where non-network solutions can fit uh, within, our, uh, within our investments. I'd like to briefly touch on the process for non-network solutions and how, they, uh, they, how we currently engage with them. The flowchart here uh, stems from the National Electricity Rules um, and shows that we do network planning and as part of the Transmission Annual Planning Report, which is what we're here today to discuss, um, we identify the potential for non-network solutions. 
There's a piece in there where we determine whether there's a RIT-T, so that's the regulatory investment test for transmission requirement. Um, and if there is a RIT-T requirement, it's a rules mandated requirement, and we'll touch on that um, soon. Um, and we follow a process that's specified under the rules. Outside that, um, if it's uh, outside the rules or it's outside the thresholds with the RIT-T thresholds, which is um, an augmentation less than $6 million or a replacement uh, greater than less than $6 million or greater than $6 million without a material impact uh, to network users, uh, we'll follow this non-rule requirement. And that's a process that Powerlink has spent some time developing in the last year. So we'll, we'll explore uh, those in the next couple of slides. Within this regulatory investment test for the transmission, it's a three-stage uh, consultation process that's defined within the rural section uh, clause 5.14, if you're interested to have a read later on. Um, but what it mainly sets out, it requires Powerlink to um, develop what's known as a project specification report, which sets out the need for the project, um, sets out uh, potential technical requirements, so megawatts um, and megawatt hours at risk, and looks at what potential non-network solutions are available uh, to meet the needs of those projects. It also identifies, um, uh, yeah, so that's what happens. It, it gets um, put out into uh, the um, public arena via a market notice uh, to AEMO for a period of, of 12 weeks, um, which Powerlink has the opportunity, or which uh, stakeholders have the opportunity to put in submissions to uh, comment and provide offers to um, provide non-network support in that space. After that 12-week period, it closes and Powerlink goes away and does some analysis, or the TNSP will go away and do some analysis. Uh, in that time, there'll be consultation and discussion with potential proponents in that space around the solution that they've uh, proposed. Following that, Powerlink will publish what's uh, known as the Project Assessment Draft Report, which summarises the uh, submissions that it was received uh, looks at uh, the credible options that um, were, under, um, were identified and the costing of those, uh, those options and the economic benefits and the MPVs uh, associated with those and comes up with a, a preferred option in that space. That uh, then is published and it goes out again for consultation for another six weeks, um, which there is another opportunity to discuss with stakeholders um, the options that they're proposing at which point in time uh, there's a project uh, assessment con uh, conclusion report that's uh, uh, published on the AEMO website and also the TNSP's website and um, that sets out what the final um, preferred or recommended solution is um, for the investment to meet the need. So that, that's a brief, there's obviously a whole lot of other factors with that, the rules specified in that space but generally it takes between 12 to 18 months to run through that process and there's defined engagement areas where Powerlink will engage with external providers along that way. The next process is something that Powerlink has been developing in-house and doesn't and it sits outside the rules. We're using it as part of our concept um, development of the process, so sitting well before we're looking at a final decision. We're looking to gain information from the market around indicative costs for solutions um, that Powerlink could be using as part of um, reinvestment to meet the needs that we're identifying. We're using it to enhance our understanding and knowledge within this non-network solution space. And it should be stressed, it's not a tender process. It's for Powerlink to engage with the market, understand uh, costs and run through a process whether those uh, solutions that are available in the market are feasible or not and something that we should pursue further. As I said before, this feasibility study that we've developed in-house sits outside the rules. It's uh, open to, or it, in, it will be for replacement projects or augmentation projects that are not subject to the RIT-T or sits outside that RIT-T threshold. Um, and we make the decision prior to, um, that determination would be, would be made prior to us actually going down the process of running this internal feasibility study. As we've got from the chevrons there, this is just a general time frame of how we'd run a study. Um, we'd develop a public uh, document uh, which sets out the non-network solution that we're, we're seeking um, and provide some specification around that, along with some um, terms and conditions uh, that would be um, expected if we were to go to contract to allow proponents to frame a response back to Powerlink. We advise um, 
non-network solutions proponents via the NESA, which is that register of our, uh, for our non-network engagement and stakeholder stakeholders, and also through AMO market notifications. It generally goes out for a period of, of one month to six weeks to provide um, proponents time to consider and come back with a response in that space. We then that take that and make an assessment of the submissions that we have received um, and there'll be an exchange of information going back and forth and we'll conclude our analysis. At which time uh, we'd look to make a statement to the market and advise via the NESA and also an email around what our outcomes were um, in, as part of the analysis. So that's the internal process. You can see where the, con the consultation parts align and where we'd be seeking to talk to the market and have those discussions in there. Very similar to the, uh, the, the RIT-T process, but probably just a, a little more informal in that it's, it occurs earlier on in the process and we're really trying to determine the feasibility of, of projects in that space. The last thing I'd like to do is talk about a real life example that we've currently got going on. Um, and this was identified in the 2015 TAPA as a non-network opportunity. So Powerlink owns two 132 to 66 kV transformers at the Garbutt substation in Townsville. Now Garbutt is located in a fairly industrial area of Townsville but still reasonably close to the city centre. It's got 132 kV line feeds from Alan Sharif uh, and it supplies 66 kV um, electricity to Ergon which supplies then the Townsville load. What we're finding is that uh, we've had our engineers go up and undertake condition assessments of the transformers and have a look at them, eyeball them, and they also do uh, oil testing of the transformers to determine how they're progressing in their life. That oil testing is known as uh, dissolved gas analysis or DGA analysis, which gives an idea of how the uh, internal insulation or the paper within the transformer is aging. What that is all telling us is that the transformers, when the assessment was done in 2015, they had about a three year lifetime left, um, which had put them at the 41 to 43 years of age. Um, and their end of life will occur around 2018. We generally expect to get 40 years from a, a transmission transformer. These in, in themselves have had quite what we call a hard life in the transmission area. They were the first ones that were established in the, in the Townsville area and they were quite heavily loaded early on. So they, it's, it's expected that a 40 year life is, is probably reasonable in this space. So the question could come back as well, what happens if you just let them run to failure? There's obviously consequences associated with that. And there's um, the, the mainly uh, related to safety, um, where there could be an explosive failure, so the transformer could fail explosively. So if someone was in close proximity or within the, trans, uh, within the substation, there could be a, a risk to their health and safety. Further, given the location of the transformer in the Townsville area, having a transformer explode um, probably isn't the best thing to occur if it was to catch fire and put smoke in the general Townsville thing. And there's also this reliability, so we're very keen with maintaining the, the network reliability and the loss of load um, that exists in the Townsville area. So we really need to do something about it by, by 2018. So as part of the TAPA 15 process, uh, we got our planners to have a look at um, whether a non-network solution is available. We had Alistair here run some studies and he came back and said, well, there's two options available. You can replace both transformers or there is an option to replace a single transformer um, and the, with a, a non-network solution to uh, cover the, the peak demand within the summer uh, for the second transformer. So we said, okay, we published it in the 2015 TAPA um, and then we went forward. What we identified was the non-network requirement um, for the summer period when it was installed was around 10 megawatts or 500 megawatt hours. Now that support was very dependent on where it was located. Uh, for, user, for those of you who know the uh, Townsville network, it's quite interconnected and has a number of uh, feed-in points um, and those feed-in points can have uh, greater or less impact depending where it is. Um, any demand side management, however, would be needed to be located fairly close to the load to gain most benefit from it. So these were the considerations that we were determining as part of uh, putting this proposal for the non-network support up. What we did then is we released um, and we ran our internal process because we determined that this sat outside the RIT-T process. It wasn't something that we were going to do a regulatory investment test for transmission on. While it was over the, the $6 million threshold, we weren't, didn't consider it to have material impact um, on, our, on consumers. So we ran forward with our internal process. 
and we developed this uh, non notification of uh, non-network solution feasibility document, which effectively set out the technical requirements of the solution that we were after, set out some parameters around that, and provided the terms and conditions by which we'd look to contract to. That closed uh, at the end of April 16. We received a number of responses to that, which we considered uh, and are in the process of considering and have had some external or further discussions in that space. And we expect to publish a final statement in August 2016. So that brings me to the end of the presentation that I wanted to do today. Um, we've got a radio mic there if there are any questions, because we need them to capture them for the, the, the taping. Um, but are there any questions on the presentation? David. I guess my question, it's probably a general question in terms of, and I'm going to relate back to probably doing similar work with the one. In terms of the information you put out there, one way you put the information out there is defining the problem. And one way you can put out there is basically saying this is the solution I want. Mm. And I guess what I wouldn't mind if you could just expand on how that sort of information goes out there. Because, uh, uh, you know, one way maybe a bit more open door, but a lot more work for PowerLink. Yeah. And I guess in the early stages, I would, I would think that you probably have to do a lot more work to actually draw out these solutions. Yeah, yeah. Look, I mean, we're, as part of our TAPA process, we're really looking at where the non-network solutions are available. It's one thing that we've really modified and enhanced the information that we're providing in the TAPA to show. Um, I suppose what we need to, uh, where the opportunities lie for PowerLink is understanding where those non-network solutions are and how they can be better integrated. And I think that's what we're trying to achieve as part of this process is really start to inform ourselves of these are the non-network service providers that are out there and these are the, the solutions that they offer. And it's about that integrated approach and, and moving forward and the exchange of information. And we have learned a lot currently from this garbage process that we've got in train around what's available and what can happen um, in that space. So yes. No, but that's something that we can definitely uh, talk about in our discussion uh, that's to come about how we can better provide that information in that space as well. I think uh, the proposal is to supply the load using a single transformer yes. and the peak demand is met by that uh, additional Correct. network solution. Yes. Like when you feed the load from a single transformer during an outage, I think you under, my understanding is that low, the, the Townsville load can be fed from other substations. Yeah, and during the main, that's so there, there's other transformers that we're currently replacing. For example, the Ingham South transformers, where we considered whether we could have a non-network solution for Ingham South, and it's purely that taking the transformer out to undertake those ma maintenance outages um, couldn't apply to the Ingham South because they're two radial lines, two 132 kV radial lines as opposed to the interconnected Townsville area where we can shift load in the winter period to undertake that, that maintenance outage. I think that's what you're yeah, asking. So, so they've got urban house, the distribution network, yeah. transfer load. Thank you. So. Okay. Yeah, But more of a fundamental question, what's the incentive? <laughs> um, because it'll be a lot easier to not go for non-network solutions, particularly if you don't if you don't have to do the RIT format. Is that because PowerLink's choosing to do this? Um, why? Well, I suppose, I suppose, and, and I was trying to paint that picture before, like we've, we've obviously got the changing environment. Um, we're cognizant of the fact that consumers are telling us electricity prices are too high. We're looking for opportunities to push down electricity prices. One way to do that is to utilise what we have. How do we utilise what we have? Engagement of non-network solutions, some of which may not be rules mandated. Uh, and so we've tried to develop and off our own bat um, to see how we, we better can implement non-network solutions to improve that network utilisation. And you're following, it seems like you're following the same path, same or format. Consistent. Effectively, but it sits well before, um, it sits more in the concept phase, whereas uh, the RIT-T is more of an integrated approach into the investment decision. So it's a two-stage. We're trying to upfront understand what's available, but also we're using it to inform where we currently sit in that non-network space and to improve our knowledge, because you don't know what you don't know until you talk to people. Um, Trevor here from Ergon Energy. 
just looking at your timelines there, like you're saying that you acquire this by 2018. I mean, you have, I mean, that's, that's just a, a, a risk, I suppose. You could push that out for a couple more years. H have you, um, I suppose, implementing non-network solutions, um, are you just looking for one provider or are you looking for many providers? Um, and how are you going to do that? And how are you, like, what we've found in Ergon is these could take four years to identify um, a provider, get a solution in, and so you've actually got to do that at least four years before making a decision to build something. So therefore, you're up to seven years out from what your normal timelines are. How yeah. are you doing that? Well, I suppose, and as I say, this is a new process that PowerLink's engaging on. We've, our experience with uh, non-network solutions to date has been very much generation and some demand side management based but we haven't had the experience at that lower distribution level, the load aggregators as such, to be able to understand how that would work. Um, obviously that would limit in terms of time frames of, of transformers and, and uh, uh, potential solutions in the future but well, I mean, we're on this program, a path of learning and understanding how we better can implement these non-network solutions in the far past. And who's to say in the next 10 years a new technology will come down uh, that's quite economic and cheap and will be quite easily to be able to implement it on the transmission network as well. So I think that there's two things. You've got this emerging technology piece, but there's also this uh, uh, path that we're on to better improve our knowledge of the non-network service providers and how they can integrate into the solutions and the investments that we have. If there's one more question, otherwise we might move into doing the group discussions. Does anyone else have a question? I was just wanting to know with um, emerging technologies and innovation, as you were talking about, it's something that companies do talk about, but they're often reticent to do it due to retraining and changing mm. standards and that kind of thing. Because this is a non-network, Field. Is that going to be different in this area? With, in With the fact that in emerging technologies and innovation will be embraced more in non-network than in the network, perhaps? Well, I think you need to probably consider it as a holistic. The network and the non-network is one. Um, the mm -hmm. non-network can obviously reduce scope, but it also can defer pure network investment or reinvestment, as you can see in the future. So definitely not considered uh, I'm, I'm sorry if I painted the picture that it sits outside the network investment, but it, it should be more of a holistic consideration in terms of the integrated approach around end of life, future requirement for asset, and how we can get the most out of those assets and, and the approach and the solutions that we, we provide. Yeah. 